Myself, I'm Dan Lavalle. I'm a learning technology consultant for Do It Academic Technology. I tend to focus on a lot of the authoring tools, um, one of which is CSCR. Um, and while I'm getting this going, I'll let Marjean and. Okay. I think, uh, uh, do you want us to wear the mic, Max? No, yeah. Or wear it between you, hold it between you. Dan's yeah. going to be doing most of the talking, but I'm Marjean Anderson, and um, I also work with Dan a lot on the authoring tools. I gave a uh, presentation on CSCR yesterday, and so um, it's in Dan's, Dan, Dan's going to get to do the talking today, uh, and I'll do a little, uh, I'll kind of be the peanut gallery as needed. Emmanuel, come on over. Uh, my name is Mel Contreras, and um, I've been a project assistant for Do It for a while, uh, just until since spring. But I've been working with CSCR for the past five or six years now, providing uh, technical support. So don't let him fool you. The <laughs> expert here is Emmanuel. <laughs> he, uh, I'm doing the talking, but he's here to correct me whenever I misspeak. So um, he's also here when we do the for the hands-on session to provide some assistance as we're moving along. So to start out with, uh, what problems do instructors face? This is a really common thing that we get asked by instructors. Hey, you know, I want to I want to create a case scenario where my students can go through it and kind of apply some of the knowledge that they're learning about in my class to real world situations or situations that they might face as a professional in the real world. Um, and you know, I, they don't necessarily want to learn some a larger tool like Adobe Captivate, which we talked about last week. And um, oh, before I get any farther, I did want to mention that this presentation is available as well at a Bitly. It's in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, so don't feel like you have to type any of this stuff up. Um, oh, of course, it's, it's getting cut off. Cut off, but that's C S C R P R E S. Yes, and it's capital CSCR, capital P, and then lowercase res. And that presentation will be on this bitly as well. Oh, wonderful. So um, if at some point later, as we're kind of doing the hands-on stuff, you can actually take a look at examples to see how some things are structured. I'll just show you a real quick one. So we can see a link here. I'm going to just go to Outbreak in Bangladesh. So this is... Okay, let me try to get it entirely on here. So we see that there's an outbreak in Bangladesh. If we go in here, we see that we are, essentially we're being tutored on Bangladesh and we're going to play the role of an epidemiologist, I believe. Mm -hmm. It's been a while since I've been through here. So I'm gonna kind of click through here quickly because I don't wanna spend a ton of time yapping at you but uh, the, first, the first few slides are just introduction onto the background of Bangladesh just getting the students um, familiarized with Bangladesh, Bangladesh in general before actually taking a bigger role in the case the idea being hey you want to learn about the culture before you would actually go over there so oh it's t it's actually prompting us saying hey you actually need to do some study before you take the quiz <laughs> so we'd watch the video it's kind of prompting us here. Here are maybe some things you might want to try to pay attention to. I'll go back. Now I'm going to take the quiz. Now I'm going to totally get this wrong. I should have done this beforehand. You can also skip the quiz for now. Um, these are just knowledge checks on what the students should get out of the previous slides um, and the video as well. So I'm not going to go too much farther into this, but you can see that the way this CSCR is structured is that it's presenting us information, it's giving us opportunities to check what we've learned, and then uh, CSCR can either redirect us to kind of let us know what we should have gained from that previous information, or it can take us down different branching paths. So depending on how complex you want to make a case scenario, you can actually, you could stop a student immediately and say, oh, that was wrong, sorry, you should have done this other thing. Or you can take them down a whole path saying, oh, you know, because you went through the red door, now you need to think about all these other things. And what these are really great for is we're scaffolding, we're, we're asking students to learn a little bit and build their knowledge, learn a little bit, build their knowledge, so that by the end of this, they're able to apply and go through a problem-solving sequence. So it's a chance for them to take all this knowledge, 
in a way, a really contextualized way, in a really rich way, because it takes in all kinds of different aspects and apply it to problem solving without actually going to an outbreak in Bangladesh. Right. So the one thing I do want to point out here is CSTR is one tool that we can do to create case, interactive case scenarios. We can use other things like PowerPoint. If you came last week, you saw us present on Captivate. We were talking about using Captivate primarily for online lectures, but it can just as well be used for interactive case scenario building. Um, I don't know if you've ever used YouTube and seen the YouTube videos where it'll go through like 30 seconds and then it'll give you a choice where you can go, you can choose for this to happen or to that to happen and then it takes you to a different video. So you can use YouTube to create case scenarios. And of course, right today we're going to present on CSCR. So if you have not downloaded CSCR, there's a link right here which will send you to the request form and we can get that installer to you more quickly if you need it. Just let us know. The reason that we have it sent to a request form and not let you download it directly is because this is going to come up shortly. This tool was developed here at UW-Madison and it's not, it's not like an Adobe Captivate tool. It's something that was developed here and that has pros and cons. The pro is it's free. Anybody can use it. It's cross-platform. It's pretty easy to use. The con is because there's no vendor behind the scenes developing and releasing the tool and fixing bug, bugs. Um, it means that UW-Madison is responsible for continued development and support of this tool. So we collect people's names when they want to download the tool so that we know approximately how many people are using it and that we can send out you know, email notices if there's maybe a new release. And uh, we can also take that up the chain and say, hey, we've got whatever it is, a thousand people using this tool at UW-Madison. We feel it's worth X number of dollars to continue to fix the bugs. The, the big con uh, of this tool is because it was developed here, um, it's not entirely clear what the future holds for CSCR. I do believe that uh, leadership in Do It is looking for potential funding streams to continue the development and support of CSCR. But uh, I can't tell you for sure, like, yes, we know that CSCR has funding for the next five years or anything like that. We're just not quite there. What we do know is that once a product is created and published, it's really a, uh, a web page. And so that just lives in the HTML world. You wouldn't be able to, yeah, so that's the products are. So the output is HTML. Yep. Yes. It's basically a static HTML web page that gets generated, so you can host that on any server or Moodle or Linux. Yep. So it's a standalone tool. It plays nice and then Linux. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, very well. It doesn't connect with the great book, but you can host it there. So for the UW Madison support solutions for web hosting, it works underneath the free bronze thing because it doesn't need a yeah. an engine or anything behind it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's awesome. all static HTML. There's no PHP or anything like that. So. The one thing that I will mention mm -hmm. is uh, if you use Learn at UW, which Emmanuel mentioned, but I want to make this really clear, it can't the output can't be connected to the gradebook. So you can't author a CSCR and say, ah, if the student gets 80% on their CSCR, this will come into my gradebook and I can see that they've completed it and I'm good to go. It can only connect into the gradebook of Moodle. So that's one downside. Does it, can it go get connected to anything? A spreadsheet or an email or nothing? Here's what I would say. Um, if you really, really want to use it and you don't want to build an outside quiz, have the students take a screenshot of the score and send it to you in an email. There you go. That's an, I mean, a workaround that. Right. I wouldn't put like high stakes testing in that, but mm -hmm. yeah, if it's a credit based or something yeah, to that. A lot of this is just for the students' knowledge check, you know, as you go through the case. So uh, a few best practices. Uh, the main one. And we're going to totally disregard these when we jump into the hands-on session today. Because <laughs> um, we want you to actually get ch a chance to use the tool with us around and uh, to ask us questions. Generally, we do not recommend that you just jump in and start using the tool. Uh, we would recommend that you consider uh, asking us for a consultation. This is uh, one of the roles we play here at UW-Madison. 
we can sit down with you and try to help you think through the kind of most effective way to develop a CSCR case scenario. And uh, think about storyboarding, literally getting out a, pe a pencil, piece of paper, and start writing down and diagramming how your case scenario might develop. The more planning you do up front, uh, the more uh, effective the time spent in the tool will actually be. I do want to mention that we have extensive documentation on CSCR. Uh, I'll click on it right here just to show you. This is all the documentation and tutorials that I believe you've mostly developed. Mostly me, yeah. yeah. So this is why he's such an expert. He had to document everything. <laughs> yeah. So he's learned it inside and out. So it's, most of the information is under the authoring column on the left side okay. in the KV. So. And if, if you are really a pedagogical expert, you'll see that it's laid out in a really great sequence. So if you just go down that and really go through each little KB, by the end you'll be, have a really great knowledge base yourself in your own brain. So what does keep versions of your CSCR mean? Essentially that means when you start authoring a CSCR, and I do this for many other types of projects that I do, be it Captivate projects or even Photoshop documents, is I'll name it like V1. And after I do a bunch of work, maybe I'll come back to it and I'll say, okay, it's, you know, I've been doing about a day's worth of work. I wanna, this is kind of a milestone for me. I, I want to be able to come back to this version of this document. And then I'll name the next version V2. And that way, if anything ever gets kind of messed up in any way, like I don't know what I've done, something's not working the way I'm expecting it to, I can always go back to a previous version. Anything else that either of you want to mention? There. So I quickly wanted, this is too long for me to kind of go into in detail. There's a handout on the seven C's, but this is a document that Les Howells and Blair Bundy worked on to help people think through effective case scenario building. And these are, essentially variables for you to think about how to incorporate into your case scenario to create something that's going to be especially engaging and effective for your students. And I think it's important to point out that this is also applicable to any case scenarios that you build outside of the tool. So it doesn't have to be um, just specifically for CSCR. Any case scenario, this is, you, know, you can use this to lay out your case. Storytelling. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I know we don't have a huge audience today, but do you have any thoughts about how you might want to use case scenarios in your own instruction? We have examples too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that this, have there been any examples of this being, of cases being used for sort of these sticky questions that don't have clear paths or right answers that sort of, it's kind of like whichever one you choose, you're, you've made a bad choice or you know there is no great answer that sort of pulls you down that rabbit hole of like which is the best of the bad choices or or what are the pros and cons of there are no right answers basically the one that I'm thinking of and I'm not super familiar with it but uh, it was one where it was a part of a design process up in the School of Human Ecology and the student is supposed to balance kind of a number of different stakeholders. So stakeholders all have competing interests. There is no gonna, there's never going to be one clear like, ah, this is always the right answer. You're always gonna kind of be prioritizing and trying to balance and negotiate between the, the different stakeholders. So again, I, I've never gotten to look at the guts of it to understand it more deeply. I don't know if you worked. This is the one in plant pathology, the no, plant I'm, no, it was it's one a that... Project uh, management one? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I think that's the one I might be thinking of. And I built one for um, an a educator, a teacher, in teacher education, where this, the, this scenario was they had to convince their colleagues. There's been a big change in um, the way we test students for special education. They had to convince their colleagues we didn't need to go full-blown testing for special education. They need to try some other interventions ahead of time. And there weren't any right answers, just Well, then I think like ideas. Um, questions on ethics or ethics in a field, you know, the 
the decisions that one makes that may or may not be, mm -hmm. you know, clear cut. Or simulating decision making in a compressed time frame, something that you couldn't do in the real world, uh, either because it would be dangerous to harming someone or just the nature of the turnaround time uh, isn't something you could do in real life, but and, you could take it. And those are big branching case scenarios, but um, you can also use this to, to kind of have an interactive workbook or an interactive lecture where you can combine, you don't have to just, for example, with physics, you don't have to just memorize this formula. You can bring in an example of how to work the problem and then maybe a video of it in action or something than that, yeah, just I, to contextualize I, it a bit I, more. I think that's exactly what I was thinking, like context is a real big one. Yeah. I have a blended And I worry that, oh my gosh, it's like this horribly dry and study this anatomy because there's not a lot of way around certain parts of anatomy, you just have to remember it. Yeah. And then when they come to class, it's a little more, it's much more interactive. Mm -hmm. We play games and we have contests and we do all sorts of fun stuff. But I'm, I'm thinking like I can break up some of the blended yeah. chunks because um, you know, what's bad in person can be very bad online. So, um, but I think giving some things some context. Sure. Say, like, hey, we just went over this stuff around the hip. Go do this thing, and I can show you some things that are more contextual. And Andy, chat with Megan Cotter down in with the cadaver lab, um, because she's doing that for her anatomy mm -hmm. courses too. Mm -hmm. So she's got some good examples of that. Yeah. All right, well.